Good morning. Welcome to Adult Bible Class here at Epiphany Lutheran Church. We're glad to have you with us today. We're continuing the Red Letter Challenge, and this week we're wrapping up the week of serving. Um, I'm Pastor Nathan, if you don't know me, and this is Pastor John. Like I said, we're glad to have you with us. Um, We're continuing the Red Letter Challenge. We're getting into the meat of this now. We've talked about the foundational stuff, and this week was really the first week, if you will, where we put the nose to the grindstone as we began to uh, do the the hard work of reflecting Jesus into the world. Uh, Last week, forgiveness was tough. This week, we're kind of being the hands and feet of Jesus, and we'll, we'll see that as we go through our Bible lesson today. Before that gets started, we like to open all of our Bible classes with prayer. So if you join us for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the service that you rendered us in your son, Jesus Christ, that he did not, he did not look at, at becoming a human as something that was beneath him, but that he willingly became one of us to take on our sin and be our savior. He humbled himself in the likeness of a servant to that end. And in the same way, we know, Lord, that he has given us a template for us to follow. We ask, Father, that as we spend time in your word today, that you would show us how to reflect your son, Jesus, to be like your son, Jesus, as we serve the people around us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, today we're talking about service. Service is not just something we talk about, but something we do as followers of Jesus Christ. And this is all over the scripture. Serving is a big part of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And how uh, our God wants us to follow and wants us to live in this world. He wants us to to act towards the people around us. From Israel's service to God, to Jesus' service to us, to Paul's description of himself as a servant of Christ, service as a way of living is a staple of life in God's kingdom. This is not a, uh, this is not a, uh, if you want to, right, as a part of the kingdom. It's a, this is what, this is part of what it looks like to be a member of God's kingdom. Um, it is a part of how we reflect Jesus. And so what we're going to talk about today is just some basic brief Bible passages when it comes to the scripture um, talking about serving. And then we're just going to discuss those. And so um, you'll, if you haven't downloaded the Bible class yet, there's a PDF in the show notes below. You can click that link and download that, pause this video, and then um, catch up to us as we continue following Jesus and as we talk about serving him here. Um, So today we're going to start off with Matthew 22 and Luke 5. Pastor John's got Luke 5. I'll read Luke 22. This is during the, um, this is after the triumphal entry and Jesus is now in the temple courts and he's talking. I know you know this, but (laughs) you're the person here, so I'm looking at you. (laughs) Um, This is after the, uh, this is after Jesus' triumphal entry. Now he's in a dialogue with a different leadership Uh, of the Jews at the, uh, during the Palm Sunday sort of, um, was this Palm Sunday? It'll be after Palm Sunday. Right. So this is a couple days later because he, Jesus. during Holy Week. Yeah. This is during Holy Week. So Jesus is talking with the leadership and uh, one of the leaders asks him a question. He says, well, what's the greatest commandment? And then just, this is Jesus's response to that. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I added verse 40 there. Um, If you go ahead and read Luke 5. Luke 5, verses 4 through 11. When he had finished speaking, he, Jesus, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, 
you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. That's a great passage. That is. Um, On what basis do we serve the people around us? Because there's a lot of different reasons we could serve the people around us. And our world throws a whole bunch of reasons Mm -hmm. out there. Why do we, as followers of Jesus, serve the people around us? Well, the simple answer, and this is, kind of falls into the law, God says so. <laughs> right. It, it, he mandates it in the Old Testament. He mandates it in the New Testament. And so we are created to do those good works that God has prepared for us to do. And so he does command it, and, and that's crystal clear. Uh, we're never called to just sit and talk about theology. We are to live it in a life of service. In fact, that's really the whole basis for the Red Letter Challenge is that uh, Zach Zender has observed there seems to be a disconnect. Right. So he commands it. God commands it. But that's the law motivation. But the, the gospel motivation is we do it because we get to, because everything that God has asked us to do, he's already done for us. Yeah, and it's, it's, not, you know, it's, it's, it's not like he's asking us to do something that he didn't step down into earth and stoop down into earth to do. I, I like that, the mm-hmm. idea that this is the things that he did. And more than, I mean, he did more than he's asking us to do. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, far more than, than he's uh, you know, asked us to go about helping our neighbor and serving our neighbor out. Um, I think about the, uh, I think about how, how our God also invites us into something that he's built us to do. That this is where we are at our best. Uh, unlike how the world talks about service, um, we are at our best when we are following how God wants us to do this. Because yeah. he knows us. He created us. He knows our inner workings and how, how we're designed to operate. Um, and we talk about this a fair bit, that we're, that we're built a certain way and our God has given us, um, has given us a, a, cl- a clue as to how that should operate. And when we follow it, we find life tends to work better. Yeah. Not always, but usually. But, but that, that's the problem. See, we were created to do works of service yeah. as a way of loving God by loving other people. And yet what's sin done? It's turned us in on ourselves. Yeah. Serving takes us out of ourselves, and now we start looking at other people instead of just ourselves. Right. And so... So for us, then, we serve because our God says so, because uh, the law motivation, because of the gospel motivation that we get to do this. He's invited us into a uh, mission with him and to do this incredible thing. And because it's what we were built to do, yeah. that's why we serve. Um, why is this, I mean, for me, like, why is this an important distinction to make? Because I think that we, we can serve without making this distinction, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. But why is it important to, for us to know our motivations for serving, do you think? It goes back to that first reading that you shared. Mm-hmm. It's all about love. Mm-hmm. You know, God really is concerned not just on what we do, right. but why we do what we do. Right. Two people can do the exact same thing, and one can be pleasing to the Lord, and the other not. Yeah. Um, that Paul says anything that's not done in faith mm-hmm. is sin. Yeah. Uh, Romans chapter fourteen, and and so just doing the thing is not the whole thing. Right. It's why are we doing it? And the great command is do it out of love because mm-hmm. you have been loved. You were created to receive love. You were created to give love in lives of service. The, the, again, the problem with sin turns us in on ourselves, and we don't do that. We don't live that way often. And then we wonder why our lives seem to be filled with discontent. Right. Because we're not living the way that we were created to live. Right. And then we find that ultimately when we're living outside of that, that there's a tension that exists in our lives. Yeah. And when we come back into alignment with God's will, um, that tension, for the most part, ceases to exist because we're living... Um, as close as we can in this life to where our God would have us be. And that's such a big deal. We specifically as recreated uh, people have have another kind of unique reason we say this. We say this because our God has remade us in the image of Jesus Christ and we're now a specific, peculiar uh, people, or as as Peter will talk about in his first letter, a... uh, 
a, an eclectic band of temporary residents mm -hmm. who are now this kind of, you know, this nation of folks that right. are... A, a holy nation, a, yeah. a priesthood. That our God's been doing. He did this in the Old Testament too. He chose Jacob, he chose Abraham, he chose the weakest, you know, lamest tribe of people in the world and said, you're mine and I'm going to watch over you and I'm going to build you into this incredible people. Yeah. And he did. And he brings them to the mountain and he says, you guys are a holy priesthood. This is Exodus 19 after he's saved them out of years of slavery, 400 years of slavery. He's brought them out of, out of Egypt and he said, now you're my people. You're this priesthood to the nations yeah. and you're going to live how I want you to live and show people how I want people to live. Now, I've been seeing this a lot recently on uh, the internet. I don't know why I'm seeing it all of a sudden, but it's been around for a while, but there seems to be a resurgence where people are focusing on the fact God calls people mm -hmm. that certainly aren't worthy to be called, and he doesn't call them because they're so awesome. And in fact, the whole thing that th th this saying is, God doesn't call the qualified. Yeah, He qualifies those whom he called. So yeah. he calls us, and then he equips us yes. to be able to do what he's called us to do. Which means I don't have to say, well, I don't have those gifts. I don't have those abilities. If God has called me to do something, God's going to give me the gifts and the abilities, the resources to accomplish what he's called me to do. Which, and we know he's called us because he has said that he has called us. That he has chosen us, that he has, he has, through baptism and faith and the work of the Holy Spirit, he has said, you are mine, and now um, you get to live this life this way. Yeah. Because he's our king. He is the, the, the ruler of this incredible gospel kingdom that we are a part of. And so those, those both work together. You know, the gospel and God's command and call all both work together in this incredible, unique way for us to uh, reflect Jesus into yeah. the world. Knowing that we're going to be resourced to do what he's called us to do. Yeah. Well, that's why I love that Luke 5 passage so much. Yeah. I mean, Peter was a fisherman by trade. He knew... When to fish, when not to fish. Right. He'd been fishing all night long, the time that you would fish. And Jesus says, after an unfruitful night of fishing, hey, cast your net over to the other side. And can you just see the exasperation yeah. written all over Peter? Oh, come on. We've been doing this all night long. Don't tell me how to do your business as a prophet. Or don't let, I won't tell you how to do your business as a prophet. Please don't tell me how to do my business as a fisherman. Right. But what's the conclusion? Because you say so, mm -hmm. I will. And he does, and all of a sudden he's blown away by the catch that God provided for him. And again, if it was up to Peter, it never would have happened because he knew better. But if God tells us to do something, he will give us the ability, the resources to do what he's called us to do. And how often do we as followers of Christ particularly in areas where we feel like we are experts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Act like Peter, where, where, we've, where we've labored and labored and labored and labored, and we've tried everything that we can possibly do to, to be successful in a particular field. And all of a sudden, it's like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he says, well, go do this. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like, Whoa, it worked now. Why didn't it work the last you know, yep. number of times that we tried it? And it's, there's this, the, the Lord, his presence, when he says do it, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. He always has a reason for us to do something. It's not as if he just wanted Peter to get tired by throwing out his nets and catching no fish. Well, <laughs> he knew what was going to happen. The question is, even though Peter didn't, he was obedient. And, yeah. and I wonder, you mentioned the... the uh, the phrase about being successful. Mm -hmm. now, how often does our success keep us from following? Because we, again, we think we know better. And we're actually going to get to that in a little bit here. The temptation where we might be successful, where that actually, it, is, is, it doesn't just keep us from following. It actually becomes a competing thing with Jesus, mm -hmm. um, which was um, Jesus's cousin's 
challenge or you know possible challenge, yep. but he he actually sidesteps that really nicely right. and and does what he should do and what we should do. I was kind of giving him a teaser for that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we do, however, are not alone in trying to figure out how to be servants. Um, God says to love love Him and love our neighbor as ourselves, and then to follow His command because we've been remade. We're in the kingdom, but He doesn't just say, "Okay, figure out how to do it." Yeah. He gives us a template. He gives yep. us a mold, if you will, and that's uh, Philippians chapter two, verses five through eleven. Um, Paul writes this. Many of you will will know this passage. We've referenced it many times before because it is just such a great encapsulation yeah. of Jesus's work in the world. Verse five and following: Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, the name of, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Who is our pattern for service towards others? God himself in the yeah. person of Jesus Christ. That's right. Uh, it, this is so good. I mean, our God knows us. He knows we need help. Yeah. He knows that we, that we need a, a, a template, a mold, something that we can look back to um, as we're following Jesus to say, look, look, we don't have to try to reinvent the wheel. We know how to serve the people around us because yeah. we've seen in Scripture how to serve the people around us yeah. because his name's Jesus. Well, and we're going to get to the John passage, John 3, in just a second. But I use that as my devotion yesterday during the communion service. Mm -hmm. It's the washing of the disciples' feet. And then at the conclusion, mm -hmm. he goes, hey, I set an example for you. Yeah. Now that you see how to do it, you'll be blessed if you do it. <laughs> yeah, go and yeah. do that thing that you just saw me do. Um, what example, now this, this kind of gets to the next question too. What example did he set for us? From the Philippians passage, he did a few things for us. He became like one of us. Yep. I mean, how does God set aside his glory? Well, and just think of what the, I mean, the glory of God. Yeah. Everything that Jesus left uh -huh. in order to come into this world in order to save us. This unapproachable thing, this incredible uh, existence that God had, Father, Son, and Spirit, since before the dawn of time, he sets aside. That in and of itself is just absolutely mind-blowing when yeah. it comes to, you think about, well, what did he have to set aside? Well, almost his godness in order to be one of us in a lot of ways. Um, he, he became one of us for the purpose of, setting, of, of, of taking on our sin at the cross. Yeah. In social media, I, I follow these uh, photographers that take pictures of the universe from, mm -hmm. you know, satellite photos or from uh, other uh, uh, right. telescopes in, in, in different parts of the world. And I can find myself just getting lost in the wonder and the beauty of the constellations that they're showing, mm -hmm. the different galaxies. It's just like, mm -hmm. wow. And that's just a, a picture that I'm seeing and I'm overwhelmed. Right. Jesus was there, and he's experiencing it all as the creator of it all. Yeah. And yet he left all that to come down into this cesspool of sin. And, and the world is a great place, don't get me wrong, but it is really broken. And yes. It's not what it was meant to be. And why does he come down? Because that's where we are. Right. And in order to serve us, he came down to be not only with us, but one of us, to walk in our shoes to carry our burden. Yep, he, he focused on this tiny little pale blue dot in a sea of incredible yeah. wonders, yeah. Um, in a vast ocean of, of stars. Uh, he focuses attention on the, if we could say it, the least mm -hmm. 
of these in order to, um, because he loved us. And yeah. ultimately, this is important because it comes back to Jesus showed us what love is. Yeah. And that's John 15, that's John 16, that's that whole high, that's the high priestly prayer. Like, this is how I want, my, my, want you all to operate. Lord, help, Father, help them to operate this way. Um, love drew, love is what, you know, brought him here. Mm -hmm. And our love or our love for others as a reflection of his love for us is what brings us out to other people around yep. us. And that gets us to John 3, actually, because we can see there's a little bit of a challenge here um, we, that we might run into. And John's got a great answer for it, but he also brings up a, a possible issue for our own service to the people around us. John 3, 22 through 30. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John, that's John the baptizer, was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because there, were, there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, Jesus, uh, well, he is baptizing, and everyone's going to him. Parenthetically, what are you going to do about it, John? <laughs> right, exactly. We're losing our audience here. <laughs> to this, John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. I, he must become greater I must become less. I like that at the end there because so often we, we flip that yeah. in our own lives where we say, I must increase and Jesus must decrease. <laughs> my wants must increase and Jesus' wants yeah. must decrease in my life. And yet John, Jesus' cousin, um, one who might as family feel the kind of betrayal most keenly, if you will, like, wait, my own cousin's taking away my audience here. <laughs> what, what's going on? Um, is the first to say, he must increase yeah. and I must decrease. Um, G John the baptizer gives us this an incredible example of setting aside a prospering, successful ministry in order that Jesus' ministry might increase. And I love this. G John never set never lost sight of his purpose. Yeah. I, love how he, I love how in that middle of this conversation, he says, um, he says, you know, I can only receive what I've been given. And how much, how much of our culture is spent on what you, you have to work for, earn for what you get. You have to take yep. it. You got to take it. Grab that brass ring. <laughs> exactly. Whereas our responsibility in Jesus is, no, no, no. We're just being good stewards of the thing we've been given. And sometimes we've been given more, mm -hmm. and sometimes we've been given less. I mean, for some folks, for some folks, um, like the 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 lure of success becomes such a big deal that it becomes a competition to Jesus' work in their life. Yeah. Um, and and what we don't have to talk about that long enough because too long because that is what I mean. Our culture is built on this idea of you are not a you know a happy, healthy, wealthy person unless you're wealthy, successful, doing everything you can to make yourself happy as an individual. Yeah, and, and you will never find it. It's yeah. going to always be elusive if you think you have to grab that brass ring in order to be happy because it's given to you as John understood. And John recognized that, that as a servant, he had to, if, if this was his time, if his mission was fulfilled, it was his time to step back and let go. And that was... Um, I got to think that was really hard after everything that he had suffered, all of the, um, the questions, the challenges, the fact that he had been set apart since before his birth mm -hmm. as one that was strange, odd, that he had, how much ridicule had he you know, gotten in his life because yeah. of how different he was? 
And suffering all that, we kind of, you know, if, if we suffer for something, we earn it, we work hard at it, we, we um, tend to get attached to it. And yet... And, and we can become resentful when it's taken mm-hmm. away. John doesn't yeah. get resentful because he realizes this is why I am here. Right. It's not to draw people to me. It's to point people to Jesus. Yep. You know, the best thing that, well, I, I don't know if it's the best thing, but in, in my never-to-be-humble opinion, one of the great <laughs> things that John ever did was to tell his disciples, because he had disciples too, hey, there's Jesus. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And two of his disciples, Andrew and John, mm-hmm. leave him. Mm-hmm. And they go and follow Jesus. Yep. That takes some confidence that, hey, I'm doing what God has called me to do. Because, you know, John and, and Andrew, they're kind of big shots. And that's, right, and that's not a false humility yeah. either at the end of the day, too, for him. I mean, these are these are big shots and... Um, John is saying, is, this is not a, oh, 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 I'm just such a horrible person kind of thing, you know. This is not that false humility. I'm just a humble servant kind of thing here. This is a literal looking at reality yeah. and truth. Yep. And because he saw truth clearly, he was able to say, go after that guy. Yeah. And that's for us too. This is not a false modesty, a false humility, a false sense of place, or a, a, uh, a, a, fa- a sense that, oh, we're just, you know, worthless people and of course people would not follow us anymore or or of course God would take that away from us. No, it's not about that. It's about um, seeing truth and reality and being grounded and rooted in what our God would have us do and what he says about us. And when we're rooted in that, it's a whole lot easier to hand that off to somebody else or to step back or to, or to say, um, to, to step back from something and say, you know what, maybe Maybe it's maybe my time is is maybe my time with this is done. It's time to hand it off to this person. Maybe I've done what I needed to do, and the Lord is you know finished with me here mm-hmm. or w- with this project, or I've gone as far as I can go. Someone else is going to have to take this further. Whatever. There's a variety of ways to talk right. about it, but at the end of the day, it takes that 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 truth and being able to see truth and reality and look at it with that, with that eyes of humility. And, 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 and you find your sense of being and your security in being obedient to God, not trying to make sure that you're looking after yourself. Right. And so for us, that goes back to that first reading we did today. What's our purpose for here while we're here on earth? It's to love God and love our neighbors. Yeah. And when we lose sight of that because of, our, because of idolatry, because of, uh, because of getting inwardly focused on ourselves, because of fear, because of uncertainty in the world, uh, whatever that, and a variety of other things honestly can help us lose sight of that. When we lose sight of that, it makes it challenging for us to act as servants. Well, and, and pastors, I mean, we're sinners just like anybody else. We can be very possessive. Yeah. And you've probably heard... Uh, the phrase where some pastor will be chided because he's a sheep stealer. Uh-huh. I, I've been ac- accused of that. And I, I didn't say this to the person who said it to me because I knew that they were hurting. Mm-hmm. But the point is, hold on, I'm not stealing anyone's sheep because they're not mine. Mm-hmm. And by the way, they're not yours either. They're Jesus' <laughs> sheep. <laughs> right. So, and sometimes, you know, there are people that have been at Epiphany for a time and then now God has moved them somewhere else. Yep. I can be resentful, but if I'm resentful, it means I started thinking that they were my sheep and not Jesus' sheep. If Jesus is moving people around where he wants them to be, yes. it is the bridegroom's job to say, hey, you're the bride. You can have, put your bride wherever you, you're mm-hmm. the bridegroom. You can put your bride wherever yes. you want your bride to be. Yep. And that for us is so freeing because now all of a sudden it's like, we know the Lord's going to provide. Yep. If he's taking one person and move them to a different location, we know the Lord either has a different direction for the congregation that is that they've left, or there's another, he's got another way of fulfilling that in yeah. some way, shape, or form. And it's just, it's, it's super freeing to be able to live inside of that and mm-hmm. trust that for sure. Um, let's go to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 here, and John 13, 6 through 17. I'll take Mark, Mark 2 here. All right. So we've talked about how, how we might lose sight of, of, of our servanthood to the people around us. We're going to talk now about how we need to be listening to the people around us, because sometimes we might also lose sight of our neighbor's needs uh, in the midst of serving folks. So this is Mark 2. And when he, 
returned to Capernaum, that's Jesus, after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Which, by the way, had to be a super let down for those guys at yeah. that point. Because that's not why they brought him there. That's right. Um, verse 6. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive this forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, rise, or your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your bed, and go home. And he arose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Man, that was awesome! <laughs> <laughs> I, what, well, we can talk about this reading a little bit more after John 13, but I, I love about this section is it encapsulates so much of Jesus' ministry into one kind of reading. We come to Jesus expecting to get something. He gives us something else. And oh, by the way, he knows our other wants and desires and fulfills those too in his yeah. own unique way according to his will. Um, and a lot of people are going to question whether or not God was actually working there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> because we think we know what we need. Yeah. God sees the greatest need of all. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but just parenthetically, wouldn't you like to have friends like that paralyzed guy? <laughs> right. I mean, they're committed to getting their friend to Jesus. And, and look at how it all ties together. You know, from the very first reading that we are called to reflect mm -hmm. God to this world because we're a kingdom of priests. Yep. And that's what John was doing. Not pushing mm -hmm. his own thing, but as priests, they pointed people to God. Right. John said, hey, hold it, guys. Don't be jealous that everyone's going to Jesus. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yep. Go to him. And yeah. so he's pointing people to Jesus. And here, these friends are doing everything in their power to bring this guy to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's really what serving is all about. It's bringing the people that we serve to Jesus Christ, who knows our greatest needs. Right. It is, I mean, what would it be, how awesome would it be if we, you know, as followers of Christ, were that committed to serving our neighbors so that they would get to know Jesus? Yeah. So we could put their hands in the hands of Jesus. Oh, man. Uh, we'd, something incredible would happen. Yeah. For sure. Yep. Would you read John 13 for us? John 13. So you'll know this is the story uh, that takes place uh, on Monday, Thursday in the upper room, literally hours before Jesus mm -hmm. is betrayed and then goes to the, through the monkey trials uh, mm -hmm. at Annas's and then at Caiaphas's building, then to Pilate, and then, then ultimately he is uh, executed by crucifixion. Right. So, uh, and I'm going to just go a little bit earlier than starting at verse. Uh, Six, verse 6, uh, verse 1 says, It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And now skipping down to verse 6, uh, he came to Peter with a towel around his waist and that basin of water in his hand so that he could wash Peter's feet. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? What he's really saying is, Lord, there's no way you're going to wash my feet. <laughs> Jesus replied, yeah. you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And now Peter's a little bit more emphatic. No, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. <laughs> Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath need only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. And then concluding, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. 
Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Oh, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, in these two lessons, I've, one of the things, that the question I've got here is what is our greatest need? Obviously, feet washing wasn't our greatest need, but it was part of Jesus' service to us. Yeah. His cleansing work at the cross, we needed to be washed clean from sin. Yeah, we get dirty. Yeah. As I told the people yesterday uh, during the communion service, you cannot live in this world and not become dirtied yeah. by the world because we're sinful. Yeah. And Jesus sees that need, and so he continues to wash through his word, through uh, the Lord's Supper. And as I reminded the people, that's why you're here to receive the body and the blood of Jesus to wash you because he's still in yep. the washing business. Well, and that's how Jesus serves us. He serves our, he meets our greatest need by, uh, he serves us by meeting our greatest need by taking on our sin to be our savior. He's going to the cross for us. This has something to say for our role as servants. Um, one of the things that, you know, that we often do, or at least I do, is I'm not a particularly good listener. I tend to jump ahead to what I think people either, where people are going, mm -hmm. or I tend to assume um, what people might need from me. Uh, one of the things that Jesus does, though, is he, he, he shows us that we start off this whole servant business by meeting the needs of the people around us, which requires us to do what? We need to get on their level, Yep. be with them, and listen. Yeah. That's right. If we're not, I mean, that goes back to that uh, Philippians 2. Jesus came down to who we were, became one of us in order to serve us. This is a pretty, um, through the New Testament, this is a pretty uh, consistent example of how the disciples, how the apostles work. Paul says, I be to the Jew, I became like the Jew. To the Gentile, I became like the Gentile. To the sl slave, the servant, the doulos, I became like that, a servant. And to the, to, uh, you know, he, he became like working people mm -hmm. when he was trying to reach working people. The point was he um, was less concerned that his life looked like his best life now, if you will, and it more looked like the people he was trying to reach in order to understand and be their servant. Yeah and be with him in that. Um, what does that mean for us then? Like, how should we seek to serve? We tend to look down on people and we will call them out. Mm -hmm. If, you know, they're in this position because they did that or they did this or they didn't do that. And if they would just get their act together, yeah. then they could make something of themselves. It's what we talked about two or three lessons ago. It's the difference in Christianity between advice... Yeah. And good news. Yep. Advice is telling people what they have to do in order to raise themselves up. That's not what the Christian message is all about. Mm -hmm. The Christian message is all about God who came down to be with us and what he has done for us. That's mm -hmm. the news of the Christian message. God has come. God has served us. God has died for us. God has set us free from those things that would destroy our lives, sin, death, and the power of the devil. He's done it all. And now as believers, we get to experience that. And then we have the privilege yep. of sharing it with other people. That's right. We, um, we miss an opportunity when we, when we kind of sit on our high horse and try to serve or when we are dispensing advice, we miss a real opportunity to get to know some incredible people. Mm -hmm. And we miss the opportunity to listen. One of the things our God delights in is listening. He loves it when his kids come to him and talk to him. Yeah. And when we, uh, when we believe we know the answer before we even have gathered the information to ask the right questions, yeah. that's a problem. Well, it's presumptuous on our part to yeah. think that we already have all the answers. Um, Jesus did. Yeah. He, but we're not God. Right. <laughs> he, right. He understood the paralytic's greatest need, but he also understood what he was coming there for. Yeah. And he meets both of them. 
the first uh, is the greatest need. He give, forgives sins, and then he also allows him to walk. He heals his paralysis. And so as Christians, as servants, we are looking to do both of those things, to serve both the physical need, but also the spiritual need, mm -hmm. the greater eternal need. And when we look at Jesus' life and when we try to pattern ourselves into this, one of the things we'll find very quickly is that we are also, the Lord's put us in positions in order to meet needs that we are equipped to handle. He's not going to put us in a position to meet needs we're un unequipped to handle. Right. And that's one of the, the kind of the, the good sides and downsides about our social media culture. Our social media culture, there's, a lot, there's plenty of great ideas on how to serve folks around us. But occasionally what happens with that is we, we will find ourselves, perhaps, at least I find myself getting pigeonholed into it's only good if it looks like this. Yeah. And, and I don't want that to be the case. And I, please don't hear that either. What we're saying is the Lord is going to position us in the community in a way that um, will allow us to meet many types of needs, ultimately for the, ultimately for the sake of the gospel. And if we're, un op if we're not open to serving people, then we're not going to be open to... Uh, walking through those doors that our Lord is opening mm -hmm. and, and the path that our Lord is putting us on um, so that other people can get to know him. And that's kind of the ultimate goal of service yeah. as we've been talking about is to show people Jesus. So, but there's so much we could more we could talk about too as we, uh, as we talk about um, serving Jesus and as we continue the red letter challenge today. Um, I really hope that you um, enjoyed our lesson today as we continued following our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. This has been helpful for you as you look to serve your family, serve your friends, serve your neighbors and your enemies as you shine Jesus, the light of Jesus' love into this incredible uh, life that he has put us in as we follow him. So we hope you have a great rest of the day in our Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.